as Rachel said, my name is Samit Shah. I am a medical oncologist here at Stanford. I focus on urologic cancers, which are cancers such as bladder cancer, testicular, kidney, and prostate cancer. And I also focus on what we call immunotherapy, as we'll get into today. We are in a very exciting time uh, in the field of oncology right now. We've seen a number of revolutionary breakthroughs in the last several years. Uh, and we're at the very precipice of it this right now. It's an extremely exciting uh, time right now where we're going to be dramatically altering the landscape for how we care for patients. And before we go into actually looking to see where we are now, I think it's actually very important that we, we, refle we reflect upon where we've been in the past as well. And I think one person who does this reflective journey incredibly well is Scartha Mukherjee in his book called The Emperor of All Maladies. This is a book that may, many of you may have read already. It's subtitled A Biography on Cancer. That is a Pulitzer Prize winning book that chronicles the journey that we've been on. And, uh, and it shows us the improved understanding that we've had of molecular biology and drug development over the last century. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, this book to many of you who are history buffs who would like to learn a little bit more about the cancer journey that we've been on over the last several years. In his book, Mukherjee explains the four pillars of cancer therapy, with the first pillar being Surgery. So if you ask a surgeon how to treat cancer, the surgeon will tell you, well, let's just cut it out, right? And so that actually works very well in early stage disease, but we know that surgery plays a more limited role in advanced cancers. So then in the early 1900s, we saw the introduction of what we call radiation therapy. So we knew that radiation or x-rays actually cause breakages in DNA, which prevent cancer cells from rapidly develop, uh, uh, proliferating and, and replicating. And using that technology, we thought at the beginning in the 1900s that radiation therapy would be the end-all cure-all for all cancers. Obviously, that wasn't quite the case, but we do know that it placed a very important and integral role in cancer therapy today. And then moving forward to the 1940s, we saw the introduction of chemotherapy, which is actually a development that happened after World War II. So we actually noticed that when soldiers came back from the World War II, those, those patients, those soldiers who were actually exposed to nitrogen mustard had very low blood counts. So they had low, they had anemia and low white blood cell counts. And autopsies that were done on these soldiers showed that their bone marrows were completely depleted. So scientists actually had an idea. Maybe we could use this nitrogen mustard, which was used as poison gas in World War II, to reset the bone marrow. So nitrogen mustard was actually the first chemotherapy that was used as an alkylating agent for lymphomas and leukemias back in the 1940s. And now chemotherapy is essentially the mainstay of how we treat advanced cancer uh, in, this, in this era. And then moving to the last decade of therapy, we have what's called targeted therapy. So targeted therapies are drugs that have developed because of our improved understanding of the molecular underpinnings of disease. For instance, in kidney cancer, we know that the VEGF pathway, or a protein that's expressed in, in kidney cancer, is very important and critical in kidney cancer success, enable, which enables it to be able to, be able to uh, proliferate. So drugs that block VEGF, such as Avastin or Sutent, play a very important role in attacking kidney cancer. We also know that the mTOR pathway is another protein pathway that we know that, it, that confers a survival advantage for these cancer cells. So attacking this pathway, by blocking it with, with drugs such as tensorolimus or everolimus uh, are very important in attacking kidney cancer. Um, and this has actually been noted in kidney cancer. In the last 10 years, we've seen an explosion of medications uh, for kidney cancer that, that have all developed because of our improved understanding of the biology of kidney cancer. So prior to 2005, we only had one really effective systemic treatment for kidney cancer. But in the last 10 years, we now have almost 10 new drugs for this therapy. So what about the last couple of years, we can actually now argue that we have a fifth pillar of anti-cancer treatment, and that's why you're all here today, which is immunotherapy. Uh, immunotherapy is also is obviously causing a lot of buzz, and there's a lot of promise that this will be a new type of treatment that will change the way that we treat patients forever. In fact, the director of clinical immunology at Johns Hopkins was noted as saying, I have such confidence in the potential of immunotherapy that I think the years from 2010 to 2015 will be looked at historically as the time that immunotherapy became the fifth pillar of cancer treatment. Uh, so we are in a very exciting era of clinical oncology right now. 
So how do we actually define immunotherapy? So what is immunotherapy? The way I explain it to patients that I say, it's a way to harness the body's immune system to fight cancer. And a lot of people think and assume that this is just a modern day phenomenon that was just developed in the last couple of years. But the origins of immunotherapy actually date back to this year, 1891, which is what many of you may not realize. And it started with this gentleman, Dr. William Coley, who was an expert in treating this type of cancer, which is soft tissue sarcoma. So Coley actually kept very meticulous records of all his patients. And one day, as he was going through his charts, he made a very astute observation. He noticed that patients with sarcoma who were infected with this bug called Streptococcus pyogenes, and which manifested as a facial rash or called erysipelas, actually lived longer than patients who did not have the facial rash. So what did Coley do? As any logical man in the 1890s would do, he started injecting people with Streptococcus pyogenes. So he took the bacteria, isolated it, and started to give it to people uh, to see if they would live longer. And he called this Coley's toxins. And lo and behold, he actually had multiple tumor regression. So these tumors, these, these sarcoma patients, started to get smaller with this bacterial injection. The only problem was now people were dying of their bacterial infection. So you can't win them all. But uh, back then, Coley was, uh, he, he thought that the way this was working is that the bacteria itself was killing the cancer. But now we probably have a better idea of what was actually going on is that the bacteria was probably waking up a dormant immune system and the immune system was able to recognize and eliminate cancer for a short time in some of these patients. So this is actually kind of the dawning of the era of immunotherapy back in the 1890s, some will argue. Now, nowadays, we actually have a little bit more sophisticated data that delineates the relationship between the immune system and cancer. So this is data taken from patients who have undergone a kidney transplant. So when you're on a, if you receive a kidney transplant, you, you receive medications called immunosuppressants, which dampen the immune system so that your, your immune system does not reject the donated organ. And you can see in these patients who have a dampened immune system that their risk of developing cancer is much, much higher. You can see here that patients who are on these drugs actually have a 20-fold higher risk of developing cancer such as lymphoma or sarcoma compared to other patients who have a robust immune system. So the thought is that if your immune system is weak and you can develop cancer and predispose yourself to developing cancer, then the corollary must also be true. That potentially, if you had a stronger immune system, you could either prevent cancer or eliminate it uh, if it does arise. So that's kind of the basis of immunotherapy then. And so one of the first modern day drugs that actually in immunotherapy is actually not that modern. Uh, IL-2 was a there is a type of immunotherapy that was developed in the 1970s. IL-2 works by stimulating the immune system by stimulating your T cells or immune cells to, uh, to have them release these molecules or cytokines, which actually inflame the immune system, rev it up, and wake up a dormant immune system. So it's, it makes the immune system much more active. And what we see when it was using kidney cancer, which is one of the first indications of uh, IL-2 therapy. Even back in the 1970s, patients with what we call metastatic or stage four kidney cancer that had spread from the kidneys to other uh, parts of the body went on IL-2 therapy. And you can see here on the survival plot that 20 patients out of 200 actually had a complete response. So 10% of patients, even in the 1970s, were getting completely cured of their disease uh, with IL-2 therapy, a type of immunotherapy. So that was back in the 1970s. So immunotherapy is actually not that new. This is just a scan to show you that there's a patient who was treated with IL-2 therapy uh, in the early 90s who had metastatic kidney cancer to their liver, as you can see here. Um, you can see here, and you don't have to be a radiologist to see that there's significant improvement. Uh, you know, even 20 years later when he was scanned, there's no recurrence of cancer in the liver. So IL-2 in itself has been a very effective therapy. The only problem with IL-2, which is why we use it so sparingly today, is that it's extremely toxic. So we have to be very cautious about, uh, about when we actually use this medication uh, to treat cancer. So these days now, uh, kind of piggybacking off this information, we have a lot more information on this field of cancer immunotherapy. And you've probably seen this in the news. You've seen it on the cover of Newsweek. It's on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, Jimmy Carter made immunotherapy very popular. He was diagnosed with stage four melanoma. Uh, so melanoma that had gone to his liver, into his brain, 
And two years after receiving treatment with immunotherapy, he's actually disease-free right now, which is pretty incredible. So why is everyone talking about immunotherapy? Well, one is that it's actually a systemic treatment. So we're not just treating one part of your body, like radiation or surgery. We're treating all the different tumors in your body. It's also targeted in the sense that we can actually activate the immune system to fight cancer specifically for the most part. It also is uh, associated with the memory. So uh, the immune system can actually remember these cancer cells, which can result in very long-lasting remissions. And finally, we also think that it's actually very versatile. So you can see it, use the same drug for kidney cancer as you do in melanoma. Uh, so all these attributes make immunotherapy very appealing. So this was a very important day in, uh, in modern-day immunotherapy. March 25th, uh, 2011 was a day that ipilimumab or Yervoid, was FDA-approved as the first immune checkpoint inhibitor. I would say that this is the first kind of novel uh, immunotherapy drug that was actually FDA-approved, and this was in the setting of advanced melanoma. Since that time, we've had a number of other immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, that have come into uh, mainstream oncology, and you're probably aware of many of these. Nivolumab, Rotvivo, Atruder or Pembrolizumab, Tisentric or Tizoluzumab. Uh, so these have all made their way into the, into the late press right now and are, are flooding your commercials when you're watching TV. Uh, so how do these checkpoint inhibitors work? And so what are checkpoint inhibitors specifically? So I'm actually going to take you back to Immunology 101 and review a, a couple of important points about the immune system. So just to give you an analogy, when you get the cold or the flu, you don't take any medications. You don't, most of you don't take any antibiotics. You take a little bit of chicken noodle soup and some TLC, and your body gets better within two weeks on its own, right? So the question is, what's actually happening within your body? So you actually have these T cells, uh, which are these immune cells uh, called uh, T cells, which is a type of a white blood cell that's floating around your body that's looking for foreign pathogens to, to kill. You also have these antigen-presenting cells here in green. And what they do is actually are able to recognize self versus not self. So anything that's not self or foreign will be picked up by the antigen presenting cell. So for instance, they'll take a small particle of the flu and bring it to the uh, T cell and then activate it when it binds together. So now you have an activated T cell that's going to go in and hone in on the flu and kill the flu. So that's the whole, uh, essentially the, the basis of, uh, of, of your immune system is that it has to be able to recognize self versus not self and then be able to use the, uh, the immune cells once activated to hone in on the foreign pathogen. So the question is, why doesn't this work in cancer? Uh, and it turns out that cancer is actually very, very, very smart. It's actually developed these escape mechanisms to evade the immune system. And how does it do this? So it's actually holding up this white flag. This white flag tells the system, uh, immune system, hey, I'm one of you guys, don't kill me. So this white flag on tumor cells is called PDL1. This is one example of a white flag. And when it actually sees an immune cell, it actually tells the immune cell, don't eat me, don't kill me. And so it actually inactivates the immune cell. And so when a drug like these, uh, ipilimumab or, or uh, tizoluzumab or any of these immunotherapy drugs, in theory what they do is they block this interaction between the immune cell and the tumor cell on this PDL1 and PD1 axis and basically lower this white flag. So it takes off the disguise of the immune system, or of the tumor cell, so the immune system can actually recognize the tumor. And now you allow, you reverse this don't eat me signal into an eat me signal. And then you have the immune cell take out that tumor cell. So that's how it works in theory. Okay? Uh, and there are a lot of different ways. That's just one way of how the immune system can be manipulated to fight cancer. There are a number of other ways. We talked about nonspecific cancer immunotherapy with IL-2 therapy. Uh, that we talked about before. We just talked about the immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are drugs like ipilimumab or nivolumab, uh, using that PDL pathway that we just uh, discussed. There's also adoptive immunotherapy. So here we can actually take activated live immune cells and infuse them into your body to see if they actually fight cancer. And there's some very promising technology called CAR T cell therapy, which we'll get to a little bit later today as well. Uh, and then finally, scientists are looking at ways of developing vaccines to actually not only prevent cancer from happening in the first place, but probably uh, more rationally, preventing it from relapsing so it, so it doesn't recur if you already have cancer. So these are all different ways that we can manipulate the immune system uh, to fight cancer.
The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.